It's looking both. Looks great. Thanks very much, Thank Owen. Let's see, it's uh, 14 minutes past nine, Saturday morning, of course. That means it's time for us to check in with two people who you're probably very familiar with by now for all the best reasons, uh, looking at the latest developments in the coronavirus pandemic. We have Professor Linda Bold, who is Professor of Public Health at the University of Edinburgh, and virologist Dr Chris Smith. Good morning to you both. Morning. Good morning. Um, should we start? Should we go in straight with lots of questions we've had um, from viewers, as usual? Um, who wants to take this? Peter. This one's from Peter. He says, in hindsight, knowing what we do now about the new variants, should we have opened up like we did on May 17th? Linda, perhaps you can pick up on that. That's a good question from Peter. And of course, we have seen, haven't we, Naga, yesterday, the ONS infection survey suggesting infections up by about 70% from the last reporting period in England. So people are wondering, you know, what the effect of easing has been. May the 17th was an important date because it meant we could see people indoors, more of hospitality opened up, and, um, you know, more people were able to go to weddings and funerals. I think the issue was we'd been through such a long period of restrictions. We'd got the R well above below one um, and, and far fewer infections. And then there were all the other harms that were occurring to people's mental health, their social connections, um, even still to education, and then of course, to businesses. So the government had to make a decision about when we would begin to ease, and that, that is what's happened. But even though we've seen a rise in infections, um, you know, we're still not panicking because the number of people that are in hospital and ICU, although that has also risen, has not gone up significantly. And final point on that, you know, we're not alone in this. Internationally, countries around Europe have been opening up, etc. We can't live indefinitely locked down. And so these are policy decisions they were taken, and we have to see how the next few weeks go. Chris, can you pick up on that? And in terms of, you know, Peter was looking back at May 17th, but looking forward to June 21st, um, I was talking to Chris Hopkins um, from NHS providers and the point was made that it for June 21st it can't be a all or nothing there will be some balances that have to be struck in terms of opening up uh, I think really where I'm coming from is that uh, on May the 17th we eased lockdown a bit further and that meant there was a lot more mixing between people and we know that mixing between people is going to translate into cases variants that we currently have in the country are defended against by those vaccines. So as the Prime Minister is saying, at the moment, there's nothing in the data to suggest that we can't carry on with the current roadmap. We have to get to grips with the fact this is going to be the nature of the beast for some time to come. The crucial thing is we are not seeing cases turning into casualties. And let's hope it stays that way. Uh, Chris, uh, just pick up on one of the stories that's uh, emerged this week, and it's been a debate that's going on for some time. What do you do about young people and vaccines? And what we now know is the Pfizer vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds <coughs> has been given the all clear. Now, maybe it's worth explaining to people the various organisations involved here. It's been given a safety clearance by the MHRA, but that's just the first step in the procedure. That's right. Um, when we make drugs and medicines, unless they're specifically invented for the purposes of going into children, we don't test them initially on children. We test it for use in the UK. But they will say this is OK to do. It is the JCVI, which is the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisations. They will actually direct the policy or guide the policy in terms of who gets what and when. And what's going to feature on their radar is when do we actually go into children with these vaccines, if at all? What's the indication for doing that? What's the, the risk benefit analysis? And what will be in the front of their minds is, what fraction of the population do we need to have vaccinated in order to minimize the chances of the virus continuing to spread through the community? Because all the time the virus is spreading in the community, there is a risk of variants emerging. That the same consideration here. Uh, Linda, do you wanna pick up on that? Because I suppose in terms of public health messaging, this is more nuanced, isn't it? Than uh, if if we get to the point where children are being the official line is that they they should be having the Pfizer vaccine, 12 to 15 year olds. The messaging around how you encourage 
young people to do that or their parents. I mean, I, and, um, I mean, we're very used to giving vaccines to children in the UK. As Chris says, it's something we do for many different conditions. And we have very good levels of vaccine uptake. And in, if in teenagers, for example, we have the HPV vaccine, which, of course, has been administered recently. And an uptake of that generally has been good with some inequality. So in terms of the messaging, there are over two million teenagers in the US that have already received the Pfizer vaccine. So what won't transmit it to older and more vulnerable people? What we're seeing in the surveys is that young adults are keen to get their vaccine when they're eligible. And I would expect teenagers actually to be the same. But you're right, we do have to message it in a sensitive way for both the parents and for themselves. You know, Linda, in terms of messaging as well, we, I mean, one of our headlines this morning, our main stories is surge testing, um, testings being ramped up. Can you focused on a locality where there are concerns either about rising rates of infection, particular variants of concern that we've been discussing a lot, um, or we just need to reach more people to identify where infections are. It might be that it's a more deprived area and we want to focus resources there. So what it means is that the government and public health colleagues will put more testing facilities into that community and then they will advertise that. You're right about the messaging, normally through local government, local radio, etc. And people can come forward. And so for example, for a variant of concern, you would also offer PCR testing. That's the, the, the higher, the more accurate type of testing. And that could be door to door, mobile units, etc. So we've seen that so far, haven't we, in Blackburn, in Blackburn, in Bolton, in Glasgow, etc. And what I would say to people in London, because of the um, the beta variant, the South African variant. But Chris, do you want to pick up on that? Because a little earlier on, we were speaking to the Director of Public Health in Berkshire West, one of those places where they're going to start doing surge testing on Monday. She was saying that uh, they've seen quite alarming rise in cases, uh, the, those as in um, people who are positive. And then one of the real challenges with this coronavirus pandemic, because normally, when I say normally, when we cope with outbreaks of infectious diseases, they have a defined set of symptoms and it's easy to tell who's got the disease and who hasn't. They have such trivial symptoms, they just write them off as inconsequential. And that fraction may be as high as half. So in other words, one person in two who can have the infection be fully infected and infectious. In other words, they're dispensing virus into the environment around themselves that's capable of infecting a third party. They may make up half of the population of infected individuals and that- Isolate if we have COVID. It's not the law to isolate. Well, actually, I don't know whether you noticed, Naga, that Michael Gove had been in Portugal and has been in contact with somebody who's tested positive, and he's actually not isolating. <clears throat> he's going to be regularly tested. So there are already alternate every day, I emphasize, there are already alternative ways to do that. <clears throat> but in terms of trying to, um, self-isolation is a really good way to protect others from being infected, and we're going to need to continue to use it for some time. But when we have more of the population vaccinated, we have very tiny, tiny levels of infection. It's very rare. We might have the occasional outbreak then I don't think people will need to self-isolate if they come into contact with a positive case, particularly if they've had both doses of the vaccine. Mm. I just mentioned that that um, Michael Gove, is, that's part of a trial, that's part of a clinical trial, that's not something that's, that's exactly, that's, that's not something being rolled out to us. To, to no, all no, let us. me emphasize that. And okay. it's important, of course, I mean, he's high, uh, obviously a, a, you know, a, a leader in the, in the country, but all these studies, we've talked about the event research program, etc. It's really important that we try these different approaches so we can find ways to keep, keep everyone safe and continue to move forward. Importantly. Uh, Chris, many people uh, watching this will have seen that the, the notion of scientists that the new, uh, what's now known as the Delta variant, the Indian variant, is deemed to be the dominant variant now. The way in which variants emerge is that when these viruses grow inside our cells, periodically, just by chance, they make genetic spelling mistakes and they'll put the wrong genetic letter in into their genetic code. And this happens with a certain frequency. Some more likely you are to get variants of the virus that in some way can do additional things. Because if you've got a change in the virus, that means it has the ability to grow a bit better, spread a bit better, bypass the immune system a bit better, make a person a bit more infectious, those viruses are going to be more successful. The variant, it's taken over as the dominant strain in this country. So it all comes down to the more people with the more virus that you've got more of the time, the more likely you are to see this happen. So that's why the current idea is to get the number of cases as low as possible, not just in our country, but in every country. And that's why Melinda Gates said it's not, if there's COVID anywhere, there's COVID 
everywhere, be as low as possible, and we minimise the chance of that happening. And we back that up with some kind of long term strategy to do surveillance and update vaccines like we do for the flu to try to have a long term control while living alongside what we think is going to become what we call an endemic virus. It's not going to go away. We have to live alongside it. OK, Chris Linder, that's done with the official hardline questions. Can I just do a quick sort of hands up? Either of you been to the cinema since restrictions have eased? Either of you? I'm afraid not. No, That's a no. Have you been to the theatre? Because sometimes people... Have you, been to, have you been to a restaurant? Have you sat in at a restaurant? Oh, I thought you yes. were in the operating theatre. I went to one of those. <laughs> no. So, Linda, you've sat in at a restaurant, yes? Yes, yes. OK. Chris, not done that? No, I, I went to a pub, actually. I went uh, with, with my friend Colin Murray from Five Live. We, we went and sat in, in my local pub and we actually had a beer. And it was the first time I've sat in a pub for a year. And, uh, and it was a very nice experience. And now the weather is so glorious. Look, got short sleeves on today. I'm looking forward to doing the same thing again. Well, you combine that with a bit of name dropping. So uh, well done, you. Linda, you're going to have to come up with something next week, maybe a bit of name dropping. It's a new equation, new challenge we've got in the system. <laughs> Didn't know that. <laughs> We're, um, I've, I've got an, I, Chris has got an open invitation to Edinburgh because right now even we have the sunshine. So heading into the summer, Chris has got to come up here and visit Bonnie Scotland. There there I don't need many, much encouragement to visit Edinburgh. It's beautiful. <laughs> oh, it's always lovely talking to you both. Chris, Linda, thank you so much. Um, Pleasure. Thank, take care. We'll see you next week. And Linda, I bet Linda will name drop something. Yeah, you guarantee it. Maybe she could name drop Matt Tebbett. <laughs>